morning. It's very good to see everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the subject of that song we just sang of Christ and his work, his death. And as it said there in the second verse, uh, the wrath of God was satisfied. Came to find in studying for this lesson that that hymn we just sang, though one of the, I think, the very best and certainly one of the more popular of all the modern hymns, is a subject in some churches and some denominations of uh, controversy. And there's a, it's the largest body of uh, uh, Presbyterians. Uh, they won't sing that song. They had it taken out of their songbook because they didn't like that line. Uh, the wrath of God was satisfied. They asked the author if they could change it for their hymn book to uh, the love of God was magnified. And he said, no, I wrote the way I wrote it. Take it or leave it. And so I, he didn't quite say it that way, but uh, they ended up taking it out of the book and he did not approve the change. So today we're going to be talking about this idea of a propitiation. Now, I know when we start to talk about propitiation, it sounds like that's one of those uh, uh, words we borrowed from another language and that uh, it's one of those technical terms that aren't that important and it isn't uh, one of these things we folks need to worry about much at all. But actually, it's not a foreign word. It is an English word. And to propitiate means to render someone... Or, or something uh, favorable, uh, so that they have a favorable disposition towards you. A propitiation, then, is the act or the thing or the person uh, that causes that to happen. So when there's an offering that's made to uh, bring peace, when there's an offering uh, to change a hostile mind uh, to a uh, more uh, congeal, uh, to, to a more uh, uh, conducive mind, to a, a mind that's been now placated, uh, to uh, to be satisfied, as we, the, the hymn said, uh, that's what we're talking about with propitiation. There are some other words that uh, go along with this. And again, all this sounds like very old English and not much the way we talk today, but words like expatiate. Well, you usually drop that one in the conversation, but uh, that means a, a cleansing or removal, particularly removal of sin. So Christ's sacrifice was for us an expatiation. Also going along with something with this, with some overlap, is the idea of uh, a uh, ransom or redemption, which is to pay the price for a sin. There's also a remitting or remission and a pardon, which speak to the forgiveness of sin. There's the effect of all this, which is to reconcile. So the effect uh, that uh, the two are brought together. And sometimes we speak of this entire operation and the entire uh, overarching thing as atonement. And sometimes that can be used to talk about a particular sacrifice or again be of the, the whole effect to deal with sins effectively. Uh, this propitiation, the reason why we bring it up and talk about it, is because it is four times affirmed in the gospel. We have Romans 3 and 25, which we'll spend some time on in a, in a few minutes uh, in reading and looking at that text. But Romans 3, 25, it says, When God displayed publicly or put forward Christ as a propitiation in his blood through faith that we, we uh, access that, uh, that was to demonstrate his righteousness because in forbe the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. And so God made a public display, a public presentation of Christ, put him forward as a propitiation. In Hebrews chapter uh, 2, it says in verse 17, it says, therefore, he had to be laid like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so that passage affirms that his sharing humanity with us was a necessary precondition for him to do this. In 1 John 2, it says this, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of of the whole world. And so that passage, Jesus is our advocate in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. And the reason why he is an effective advocate is he is the one who brought peace between us and God. So when the peacemaker stands there arguing for us, it can be quite effective. And also again in 1 John, 1 John 4 and verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation 
for our sins. And so it's an act of love. It is the uh, act that helps us to have access to God. It is the one, uh, it's the reason why Christ came in the nature of flesh. And it was God who presented him or put him forward to do this very thing. And so what we find is uh, God here was seeking peace. And the great promise of peace that is in the gospel is understood as the blessing it is only if we first understand the hostile reality that is there without this. If we understand the place that our sins have caused us to be, that the sins that we commit against a holy God brings righteous wrath. If we don't have that concept to start with, then the rest of this doesn't seem to make much sense. Uh, There are many today, uh, theological liberals or uh, just unbelievers, who look at the uh, system of salvation by faith in Christ and the gospel, and they see the the place of, of the sacrifice of Christ, that God sent his own son. And they talk about, uh, this uh, bloody atonement. And they talk about, uh, some of them will talk about this, this vicious salvation. They'll talk about this, this uh, violent way that God proposed. And they'll act as though uh, that, uh, you know, they're too morally superior to take part in that. They've got past that. Well, uh, they, they may be past it, but not in any good way, not in any way that progresses any closer to reality. But there is this reality that we today often uh, ignore, and, and in some uh, teachings, even under the guise of Christianity, have been taught to ignore, uh, or have just ignored because it's deeply uncomfortable to think about that our sinfulness against his holiness brings a righteous wrath. It just has to, because he is actually righteous, and he actually cares about people's conduct. He actually cares about the way we, his creation, made in his image, treat each other who are also made in his image. And so uh, we just we can't just have him say, well, I'll just get past that. I'll just overlook it. Uh, what would be the disposition of any of you fathers if I or one of my boys did something horrible to some of your girls? I say, well, just get over it. Just look past it. I mean, well, how does that bother you anyway? That's my kid right there. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, no, God worries about it just like you worry about it. And true love and true justice means that something has to be done and that situation has to be dealt with. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to be uh, forever anger. It doesn't mean that it can't be reconciled. It doesn't mean that it cannot be effectively dealt with. But it just can't be swept under the rug. And most folks who uh, think about a, a, a way of salvation where they would imagine there's a way of reconciliation to God and forgiveness of sins that does not account for a penalty to sin, they're just uh, hoping for that which cannot be and that which the holy God has said, I cannot put up with that. And so uh, these people uh, who act as though uh, that something was wrong with this or, or God should have found another way or I don't understand why that was. Uh, you just go against them. You slight them. You harm them. Heaven help you today. You offend some folks. And look at the righteous dungeon they get up into. And, and we realize that we have this as a uh, part of our being made in the image of God. Why is it that things offend us? Why do things uh, why do things affect us even when they're not always directly directed at us? Again, you just harm somebody's child or somebody's dog and see what happens. Uh, but what they want is they want God to be the permissive parent or they want God to deal with uh, you know, the way Santa deals with the naughty. How does Santa deal with the naughty? He extracts from them an incredulous pledge to do better and give them a present anyway. Isn't that how a lot of folks want salvation to be? I promise I'll be nice from now on. Okay, here you go. It's all wrapped up. Had it in the sleigh already ready because I was pretty sure you were going to pledge to be nice. That is not the way a righteous God deals with sin. Every sin is against God and every sin concerns 
God. And how does he deal with that? Those sins build up a righteous wrath. Psalm 51, David said in his confession, I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned. And I've done what's evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. When we deal with sin in a biblical way, in a rightly way, we'll understand God's righteousness to judge. If you're not dealing with your sin, one of the ways to deal with your sin in an improper and ineffective way is to blame God for judging it. And how many do that? But when we go in our knees to God for what he has provided in Christ, we can say like David did, God, you're right. God, you're, you're blameless. And God, I am wrong. And there is so much wrong. Ephesians 5, 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the sins listed above, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The right wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. He just cannot let harms and wrongs against him and against those that he made in his image. He cannot let the evil that people do against one another. He just cannot and just will not let that slide. Sometimes in life we have to let things slide. We don't have the authority, the knowledge, or the power to make a just recompense. When somebody has harmed me and I have some power against them or over them, what might I do to them? I remember years ago, I was watching a documentary. It was about the Hells Angels. And the guy was talking about, he was the Hells Angels. He was talking about why nobody messed with them. He said, because we had a rule that if anybody did something to us, we'd do three times to them. If they broke a bone of an angel, he said, we'd break three bones of theirs. If they killed an angel, we'd kill three of theirs. Well, I guess that's effective in keeping peace. You intimidate everybody around you. But he thought that was a good rule. Well, if we have power and authority over folks, what will we do when they harm us? Whatever we like. And we don't know how to do it justly. We often don't, as I say, have the power, because most of us, like unlike hell's angels, don't have the power to go break, break people's bones, or we're too morally restrained to do it. Or we realize that's not our role in life. Or we don't know which guys to go break their bones of. Somebody hurt my daughter. Who do I go hit? I just go in there and get them all. Let God sort them out. Well, no, God will sort them out. And so we, we, we cannot ourselves take wrath or take our own wrath, take our own revenge, because we're out there as worthy of wrath. And so we're given this instruction for us as individuals, never take your own revenge, beloved. Right? Never take your own revenge, beloved. But what does it say in Romans 12, 19, continuing? But leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is, <clears throat> vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So God is the proper agent of vengeance. God is the proper exerciser of wrath. And most of the time we think about wrath here is judicial wrath, not just anger, but judicial wrath, judicial punishment. And that was in the book of Romans. It's no surprise that that leave room for the wrath of God appears in the book of Romans because 11 times in the book of Romans, the word wrath appears. Wrath appears 11 times in the book of Romans. Twice, it is about the uh, exercise of uh, civil power and leaving room for that kind of wrath, the wrath of, of government to punish evil. But that is based squarely on and first on the righteous wrath of God. In Romans 1.18, right from the start, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. In chapter 2 and verse 5, if you, because of the stubbornness of, of and unrepentance of your heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So there's a righteous judgment, a righteous revelation of God's righteous judicial wrath. In chapter 2, verse 8, there are those who by selfish ambition and don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they'll receive wrath and indignation. And in chapter 3, verse 5, God inflicts wrath. In chapter 5, verse 9, much more than having been justified by his blood, will be saved from the wrath of God through him that is in Christ. And finally, in chapter 9, 
What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. We make ourselves vessels of wrath. We make ourselves fit for wrath when we sin against God. Uh, here's a few points from another author. Uh, I'll, I'll just quote his headings. He had long sections under each of these headings. First section, there is no want of power in God to cast wicked men into hell at any moment. Point two, they deserve to be cast into hell so that divine judgment never stands in the way. It makes no objection against God's using his power at any moment to destroy them. Point three, they are already under the influence and condemnation of hell because of their sins. Point four, they are now objects of the very same anger and wrath of God that is expressed in the torments of hell. And the reason why they do not go to hell at each moment is not because God whose power in whose power they are is not at present angry with them, but he's being gracious. And the sixth point, there are souls of wicked men who in the, who these hellish principles are reigning that would pre presently kindle and flame out into the fires of hell if it were not for God's restraints. It's a great sermon. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That's the middle part. Uh, at least that's the headings. But he's right. Uh, that was Jonathan Edwards. He's right. And so there is this continual provocation of, by sin and by rebellion against God which stores up and builds up Wrath, And we will note in this thing that it is continually a one-sided provocation. I know people blame God for all sorts of things and all kinds of things. But what do they normally blame God for? Well, I think most of the time it's for not giving them enough of the things they want. Occasionally it's for God, they say, causing something that they don't want. Uh, a lot of times those things that uh, they get that they don't want, they blame on God. A lot of times that is actually the action of Satan, not the action of God. Sometimes it is the judgment of God. It is uh, a, a chastisement of God as well that might come upon them. And so uh, they blame God when they're punished for that which they should have been punished for. But most of the time we blame God just because he hasn't given us enough stuff. We live in a world of people who are like the kid at the candy store whose mother says, no, come on, it's time to go. You're just going to get that you know, two-pound bag. And he goes, I want the five-pound bag. I want the 12-pound bag. I want every bag. And it, these kids who throw a temper tantrum in the store because they don't get everything they want is unfortunately more the moral reality of so many in our society than restrained and disciplined and well-mannered people. And so it's a, there's this continual one-sided provocation where we sin and provoke and God in gentleness and reasonableness calls and we still continue to go against him. In this uh, famous statement from Isaiah, Isaiah 118, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be as wool. Just come and let's reason and let's get this straightened out and we'll get you cleaned up and cleansed. We'll get you all washed up and ready to go. Verse 19, it continues. If you consent and obey. Where does it break down? With people sitting down reasonably to talk to God and deal with things, with their consenting and with their obeying. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. And then they'll blame God for that too. Truly by the mouth, truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there is God's reasonable offer to unreasonable people. And what does the very next verse say? Verse 21. So many treasures if we just continue to read. How the faithful city has become a harlot. She who was full of justice. Righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. And that, you know, that's the opening salvo in Isaiah. How do you think the rest of the book goes? when it comes to the people of their time, is continual provocation, is continual sin. But what, how do we know the end of the book of Isaiah? The great prophecies of the Messiah to come. Because while we have this hostility caused by our continual, on our part alone, provocation and sin against God, still there is peace offered. And just as it was a one-sided provocation, we'll note that it is a one-sided work for reconciliation. 
Who worked for the reconciliation of sinful men and God? God worked for that. Did sinful men? God worked for that. So 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, this wonderful statement. For God has not destined us for wrath. That's where we would have been, but he's interposed. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we shall live with him. And so this was God's work. The people didn't help. The people hindered. There's that wonderful parable of the wicked husbandman. It's, it's, it's wonderful in the grace of God. It's, it's sad in what it says about the people. But we, we remember that there was a man who set up these, these men in a garden, in a vineyard. And when the harvest time came, he sent slaves to the vine growers so that he could receive the produce. And Matthew 21, 35, the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. That was Isaiah, they killed him. But afterwards, he sent his son saying, they'll respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and seize the inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. He sent his son to them in verse 37. The same phrase that John would use in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, in one of these passages we just read about a propitiation. This is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, the, there's a beautiful first verse of the, the song by the Gaithers, Because He Lives. God sent his son, they call him Jesus, sent him to love, to heal, and forgive, right? And he bought my pardon uh, with his blood, and an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. It's the best opening to any modern hymn I've ever heard. I wish the rest of the hymn kept that up, but, but it's, a, it's a great, great opening. They, he sent his son. And so here is the action of God, the one-sided work for reconciliation. As the provocation was one-sided, so is the justification, and it is because God put forward the remedy. Now, that is a turn of phrase from Romans 3 and verse 25 from the English Standard Version. It's interesting. You get down to Romans 3.25, and uh, it's all different kinds of ways that English uh, translations uh, have rendered these verses. But let's just read the whole thing, the context. Romans chapter 1 through 3 is the need of people to be saved by God. There's the sinfulness of the Gentiles, well, the whole world of them, right? Uh, they they, uh, they didn't uh, thank God. They didn't honor God. Uh, he gave them over to degrading passions, all that of Romans 1. Then of Romans 2, well, what of you Jews who condemn them? Do you not rob, you know, you say uh, uh, don't commit adultery, but you rob temples. You say don't commit adultery, but you commit adultery. And the Gentiles dishonor God because of you. And so we get to eventually the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that is a, a verse in this reading where everybody needs salvation. Everybody needs salvation in Christ. And the Apostle Paul shows how that God through Christ is offering that. And so he outlines all the things he's going to cover through the rest of the book of Romans in Romans 3, verses 21 to 26. So now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in, in Christ Jesus for all who believe, there is no distinction. And everybody needs it for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Now we continue to read. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. And for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so my translation, the New, the New American Standard, and, and also this is true of the American Standard, the King James, and the English Standard, they all say that Jesus is the propitiation through blood or his blood. My translation says God publicly displayed him. The King James and American Standard says he, set, he was set forth. And I really like the English Standard. 
God put him forward. God put Jesus forward. He said, here is the propitiation. Here's the thing that's going to bring peace. Here's the thing is, uh, that him in Christ alone said, satisfies the wrath of God. This wrath of God that you're building up. This punishment that you richly deserve. I am putting forward the one who will bring us peace and bring us together. Uh, in the NIV and in the New Revised, it calls this the sacrifice of atonement that is through his blood. And then interestingly enough, uh, a couple of uh, translations, the Christian Standard Version and the NET, which are both pretty reasonably good translations, they say here God presented him or displayed him as the mercy seat, which sounds really weird when you read that passage. You find out that the, the word here that is used for propitiation in Hebrews 9, 5, when it describes the things that were in the temple, uh, which are now no longer ours, but uh, were under the old system, it uses the same word for propitiation as it does to for mercy seat. It describes the mercy seat as a place of propitiation. I think these translations have got it a little backwards. I think it's calling the mercy seat a place of propitiation rather than calling Jesus' propitiation the mercy seat. But it is an interesting connection that the mercy seat, the center of God's uh, grace in the Old Testament, is the word used to describe Jesus. Because it's a type and a shadow. It's a figure of him who was to come. But all of these talk about him being displayed or put forward or made known. God put it out there that here's the, he put forth the sacrifice and then he told us of the sacrifice. Because again, whose work is it to bring this reconciliation? It's his. And what do we do? Well, it talks over and over here about us receiving it through, through faith. And so when God does this, as it says in verse 26 here, he is just and the justifier. So he justifies, but he's also just in doing it. As I mentioned a while ago in the example of where, uh, you know, you harm somebody's dog or their daughter or their wife or, or you, you offend somebody. And you just can't say, and God can't say, well, we're just going to count like that didn't happen, right? You know, if I, break the, if, if I harm somebody enough that I break the law, I might have to deal with Matt in his office for a while, even if the other person forgives me, right? I might still have to deal with the fact that the law says, no, there's a punishment, a penalty for that. Well, God's righteous judgment is that there's a penalty for sin, and there's a, there, there is uh, a punishment that is to come. But God justly deals with that even though he freely forgives us. Well, think about that. He justly, he justly deals with the wrongs we've done even while freely forgiving us of the wrong. How does that work? The price was paid. The penalty that was owed was more than paid off in the work that was done in Christ. So God has a just system. God has a just system and a system also that lets him justify all those of faith in Jesus Christ. And so we come to the great thing. Romans 1 through 3 is the need of salvation by faith. And then in Romans 4 and 5, it explains about salvation by faith in Christ Jesus. And in the middle of those two chapters, at the beginning of chapter 5, there's sort of a midpoint summary. There's a midpoint summary of what Paul has said about salvation by faith in Christ. And he says this. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. This is one of those Greek tenses. that it, it, It's one of those aorist things. It means it's a totally fully thing done completely in the past. The peace has been accomplished. The peace has been made because it's in that one time offering, right? You go to the book of Hebrews and how many times does Jesus have to be offered for sin? Just once because he dealt with all of it for all time. And so in the, this propitiation, this bringing satisfaction, this bringing uh, peace again, it's a one time for all time thing just like his one time for all time dealing with sin. He has completely and he has fully dealt with it. And so we now have peace. And that, that is one of those completed action things. Peace through Christ is accessible. Peace through Christ is offered. As verse 2 continues to go on. Through him 
also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And so just look at the things that are here uh, in this verse, faith and peace and grace and hope. That, those are our words as Christians, aren't they? That's what we traffic in. Grace and peace and faith and hope. And it says it's to the glory of God. And so there is where we stand. There is our theology. There is our reason for being. There is the things on which we center our minds. Because peace was made in Christ. Peace was made by Christ that peace for us to reconcile us back to God. As John the Baptist, quoted by John the Apostle, but John the Baptist says in John 1, he says, as he saw Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the reason why he could do that was, he was, as the next verse says, the man who comes after me is higher rank than I. He existed before me. And so the eternal God took on flesh. He offered himself in that body of flesh. He paid for our sins. He brought satisfaction to us. He made propitiation. He brought us atonement. And there's so many different ways we explain this. He expatiated for sin. He is our ransom and our redemption. In him we have remission and pardon. All this done to reconcile us back to God because He rightly, and uh, uh, as a matter of grace and kindness for us, took away the sins of the world. That's all our sins. And he ended that hostile reality that stands between every sinner and unrepentant sin before God. For every sinner with, with unforgiven sin, there can be nothing but hostility and the face of justice. And you don't want justice for sins, do you? You want grace for sins. You, the, the, that, that wrath, that justice, that punishment of sin, that is the world that all those unforgiven face continually. But in Christ we have found grace so that we have found peace because God has justly justified us because there has been a propitiation, a ransom of redemption, a payment suitable for our sins in Jesus Christ. And so the propitiation As the the text says again four different times, he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, but the sins of the whole world. Have this grace, enjoy this grace, also tell of this grace, and share this grace through the gospel.